Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. From Los Angeles, inside the Computer Hell Cabin, the coolest name Ooh. thus far. Maybe the coolest studio. <laughs> this is Score, the podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Holmes, back and recharged with my co-host, Robert Kraft. Hey. And we also have... <laughs> Not as recharged. <laughs> hey. He hey. took a nap. <laughs> uh, we're also joined every week by our executive producer, the MASH Raider, Matt Schrader. Hey, Matt. Woo-hoo! There's Chris Beck. <laughs> he's excited. He, he's, he, this is exactly my feeling, being back. Woo-hoo! We, wow. uh, we took a little break. We are glad you stuck with us. Hopefully you're all caught up on the show. There's so many inside jokes. We want to make sure you guys know what we're talking about. Two words for you. Jordan Bieber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're very excited about today's guest. He's an award-winning composer of Mad Max Fury Road, Deadpool, Black Mass, Tomb Raider, Batman vs. Superman, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, 300, Rise of an Empire, The Dark Tower, so many big movies, big, big movies, and also video games, uh, FIFA 18 for those getting over their uh, World Cup hangover, uh, Forza Motorsport, Madden 16, Need for Speed, Pro Street, so many. And just an incredible artist in every sense of the, the word, truly incredible as a composer and a contributor to the world of film scoring, the world of dance music, everything. Uh, yeah, he's, really interesting. He's guest Tom today. Holkenborg, aka Junkie XL. And JXL. He goes by both. We're going to clear up what he prefers because some, sometimes you see it as Tom, sometimes you see it as Junkie XL. So, and in Mad Max, it was Tom Holkenborg, aka Junkie XL. So mm. we'll get to the bottom of that. Also on today's show, we're going to review our Emmy locks. We gave our locks. Matt made a bold statement saying he would be willing to bet <laughs> that we were correct. So uh, Matt might have to pay up. We're going to talk about the Emmy nominations for score and TV shows and everything uh, that uh, unfolded in the last couple of weeks. How did we do? Plus, another chance for our audience to win a fabulous prize. We're going to be playing Name That Score with Name Junkie XL. That score. What's the topic today, Matt? Blockbusters, number one films at the box office for the last 18 years. These are all 2000s number one films. So most people have is, probably seen these. Is Score the film documentary that we made? Is that one of the number ones? I, the last? Uh, I, uh, I wish it was. I have to go back and look. <laughs> maybe documentary for Film Score fans, number one. Yeah. Maybe we'll do documentaries, then no one will get the answers. <laughs> Music from documentaries. Also, Love we have a, a special little segment that I don't have a little bumper for. But uh, Matt will give us his summer, summer TV review. review. Ooh, cool. Nice. <laughs> Thank nice you. Drop. It'll be epic. I'd be very curious. This to is hear. Uh, just a few shows, a couple that uh, maybe haven't lived up quite to the hype, a couple of those hanging in there, and then a couple that I love. Um, so uh, stick around for that. We'll visit that in just a second. But um, Kenny. You were talking about vinyl records. Yeah, so if you guys follow me on social media, sometimes I post when I'm spinning something. But um, I've I've definitely been roped into the excitement of vinyl over the past couple of years. It's a big boom, and there's actually some new numbers out for the first half of 2018. I don't know if you know this, Robert. But is this breaking news? This is. Let's head over to the, the, the anchor <laughs> desk. Uh, sales for vinyl are up 20%. In the last year. That means four vinyl records have been sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. I think the, it's a lot more than that now. Di- like digital downloads are even down because streaming subscriptions are up. So mm. that's true. That's pretty amazing. The vinyls are, are up. So they're actually outselling digital music because people that are listening to digital are paying the 10 bucks a month for Spotify or iTunes oh. uh, to stream or Apple Music, I should say. Um, and also, it's interesting to note, too, that on July 1st, Best Buy stopped selling CDs, mm. but they're still selling vinyl. So, like, CDs are now the minority and vinyl is back. Incredible. Which is really cool. Yeah, why, why is that? Why is it, it, it? I admit, I don't totally get the vinyl thing. It seems like the quality isn't probably... I mean, I've heard people say the quality's better on those, but that can't really be the case, can it? Well, I, I mean, I don't know if if you spin a vinyl at home. The, it's so much... It, it sounds completely different. It's a lot more rich. There's more low tones. Um, and some of the cool things about vinyl, for one, the artwork... Um, it really brings back 
looking at an album cover. I mean, when right now, if you download a song, you get this little thumbnail on your, you know, a lot of time is spent on some of these album covers and you don't get to see a lot of detail. Plus they come with posters and the lyric sheets. Liner notes. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And even, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mondo. Mondo is this uh, Austin, Texas-based company that releases uh, classic scores that ha- are being re-released, and they have these really cool artists redesign. You know, for example, like I just got the Jurassic Park one a couple weeks ago, and there's really cool artwork on those. So it's almost like a conversation piece. If you have people over, you're playing the physical media. Plus, people sure, can yeah. thumb through your your library and see what you have. You know, we're in this age now where you you pick and choose every song and you don't actually listen through entire albums and stuff. So I think people are starting to get appreciation more of going through all that stuff. And plus vinyl, it lasts forever. I mean, if you go to a used record store, you can get so many. I mean, Robert, you you probably you lived through the the first vinyl. It's so interesting. First of all, of course, my introduction to being a recording artist was making a vinyl record was the destination to actually see your record on vinyl in a sleeve in a record store and those became the trophy so vinyl became great you know i was maybe two weeks ago cleaning up my attic one of those things that i've resisted doing for about six or seven thousand years (laughs) i found what the it's called the mother which is the vinyl that your album is pressed from for my first album mood swing and one of the things i remember about it forgive me for sharing was it had a smell of vinyl in a way that you know the commercially produced vinyl mass produced records i don't know if i need to get a copy of this it was really amazing because it brought me back to the day i first was given the mother which they had pressed the record from and it had this really incredible kind of chemical smell and it was physical you could hold it it was so exciting and I think there, vinyl's tremendous. is there anything better than the hunt to like going into the store and you could spend hours in some of these record stores just thumbing through and and you're almost like finding a treasure maybe it something is a treasure. that means something to you yeah. but you know instead of just searching a word because you you might stumble on something you weren't even looking for oh, i love is- that you compare it to searching word because you're right you can google something but there's also, you know, it very much applies to hip hop and electronica now. Cause yeah. Finding a rare sample and, and sampling another, a groove is another thing to note too cool. is that if you buy the the vinyl, some people say, "Oh, well, you can't take it anywhere." But most of the records now that are coming out, these LPs, they come with a digital download. Or if you buy them on Amazon, they they download it straight to your account, so you can still have the digital version, but you also have the cool physical record, which is really fun and. It gets you getting up off the couch every every twenty minutes. That's so nice. Fresh. I love it. I wonder so- if forty fives will come back. You know, I one of the things I found cleaning up the attic is I have a lot of the forty five, you know, with the big hole in the center that I grew up with. And uh, it sounds like I'm dating myself, and I am. But those were <laughs> really valuable to I, me. I came across so one of my favorite bands, Death Cab for Cutie. I they had a tour like five years ago where they they actually wrote all their songs with an orchestra and they Hmm. toured and I was like I can't wait for the album to come out never came out always thought about it man it would have been so cool to hear that it turns out they released it on vinyl only so in the last couple years when I had this record player I found the vinyl and it's great so happy so they have really cool special editions that are released only on vinyl too so a lot of reasons to be into it. It's a really cool thing, and um, especially if you're a soundtrack collector, uh, companies like Mondo and a, a lot of these independent labels that release so many. I would assume that there's more scores being released nowadays too, just because of the ability to you know put them out digitally and also independently. But a lot of cool stuff out there. The announcement they made for uh, for Jeff Russo's Star Trek Discovery, that's the coolest looking vinyl that I've seen. Oh, today. yeah. There's such cool, like, pla- the, the vinyl, the actual records are, are in these really colorful splash of color. It just, it looks. And now they're doing that with the, the actual pressings, too. Yeah. They're making it out of, like, these crazy A lot of the Mondo melted ones. colors. My Jurassic <laughs> Park one is, like, orange and red, like, blood orange and red and black it, it looks really cool i i highly suggest getting into it checking it out um it's it's really fun and and then again you you have something physical to look at and, and you through. interact with the music in a way that's very different from clicking on a link 
It's a cool sign mm-hmm. of, of things to come. Plus, I, th- I would imagine the artists get more from it because these streaming services, I, I know you've read some of these articles where they're not getting as much money as they used to if you buy an album through the, or, or if you're streaming versus buying an album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking down and looked up. It just... <laughs> I was just looking at my bank account to see if this is actually true. <laughs> On that note, Matt, I think it might be time for what? For summer, summer TV, TV review. There's, these were a few, and guys, feel free to chime in on these. I don't know how many of these you've seen. I, I have my list out here, and I want to work in reverse order because there's some great. T- this is like the best age to be uh, a- a- accessing TV. There's so many different networks. There's so many different TV shows. There's something like 600 shows, original series that are out. How many times a day do people go, are you watching so-and-so? And you're like, oh, I oh. haven't got And they're like, what? It's the best show on TV. There's so many. There's not even enough time in the day. So, and, and a lot of them are really, really good. Now, some of them don't quite live up to the hype because the standards are, look, 50 years ago, the the TV shows weren't that great. Like, they were for the age, but they didn't have the Breaking Bad back then. Right. You know, so it, it's a completely different standard. But now, some of these shows are really, they're standouts even for today. So, I got a couple of my favorites. First off, I want to start um, with a couple that I haven't been that impressed with. The first one has virtually no music. That's Arrested Development, the last season of that, which was very – it just came out. Um, was that the recut one? No. They, or- so they did – this is a weird thing. They, I've never seen this done with a TV show before because the first three seasons of Arrested Development were, were cult hits after the fact. The ratings weren't that great when it first came out, but then went on, I think, Hulu maybe first and then Netflix. Um, and Netflix made a fourth season – it didn't do that well. They changed the format a little bit. And then they decided they were going to do a season five, which is the one that just came out. And uh, and what they did in the process was they cut that season four. They chopped it all up and structured it in a totally different way. They actually reshot a couple scenes for that, but made it into basically a different presentation of the same story, um, which it actually helped it quite a bit, in, Interesting. in my opinion. But season five that just came out, uh, I think John Powell says it best. Sounds like five pounds of cheese. It's not the uh, <laughs> not the greatest show, so uh, I'm I'm giving that a uh, I'm giving that a thumbs down for now. I don't know if there's going to be another season. There's rumors of a movie, which I'll check that out. But uh, but season five of Arrested Development, eh, I'll pass. Um, another one that I really liked uh, the first season of was Amazon's Goliath. I'm a big Billy Bob Thornton fan. He's great. He won a Golden Globe for his performance in the first season of this. Um, the second season didn't wasn't anywhere close to what that is. Do you, either of you guys have you seen Goliath? I haven't, but I've heard exactly what you're saying. Where the first season had a style and it it went a certain way, and then they they broke from the the style of season one and went in a completely different direction. It was really in the first season. There's I won't give anything away because it's worth watching. But the first season uh, talked a lot about this this big conspiracy. There's this corporate conspiracy and. A, you know, a company that's involved. It was a little, there was a little kind of cartoonish elements, but, um, but it was, it was really good drama, really good performances. It was, it was truly fresh. Um, pretty, pretty fresh. fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it, it really worked from, from start to finish. It was a really good show. The second season changed that a lot. And it feels like a law and order episode that's been stretched out Whoops. into. So it, it, the stakes aren't there. The, you know, there's a lot of other dramatic elements. The acting isn't really, you know, they, they kind of jump the shark in a few ways. So it's not, uh, it's not what season one was. Watch it just for Billy Bob Thornton alone because he's, he's fantastic. I'm yet to see a show that he's not great in. But, um, but that's another one that, uh, that I think we give. Uh, Sounds like five pounds of cheese. Five pounds of cheese. Oops. Um, so we're moving on. <laughs> Is this our new rating system? Because I love it. <laughs> five pounds of cheese and then, uh, and then pretty fresh. Or woohoo. Uh, or woohoo! Or well, I'll, when we get to it, I'll use I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you another one. We used it in the last episode uh, from Chris Beck. Another little bite that he gave us. Um, so it, it's a couple shows that are, are kind of hanging in there, and I've upgraded one of these. Uh, but the first one's Cobra Kai on YouTube. Um, the Karate Kid. Yeah, it's basic. It's basically up, a right? spinoff of that, um, and. That's the only reason it's really kind of interesting uh, is because I, it ties into something else. I don't uh, know much about the show other than the composer mm-hmm. actually 
contacted us to say he'd love to be part of Score. He's a fan. No. So I think and the I music's told him, cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the music's cool. Um, the the show is like in that that middle ground where it's it's this is not the best TV right now, but it's entertaining. It's, it's season something. one, right? It's season one, so, so it's you know, finding we'll its way, maybe. And ultimately, most of their audience is going to be people that know the Karate Kid from something. So it's and Ralph an, it's Macchio enjoyable. is in it. He's in it, and so you uh, have that nostalgia points. So it's okay. Um, so uh, I, we need a sound effect for that one. I don't have one for that, but uh, we'll just give that a uh, awesome. An awesome, I guess. A Kenny awesome. A little mid-range Kenny awesome. All right. Um, and then uh, the other one that's kind of hanging in there, I've upgraded this one, too, um, after being downgraded at the start of the season, Westworld. Now, there's a huge fan base on this. The music, Ramin Jawadi does of great course. music for this. Tremendous. And, and it's really, really interesting. Ramin Jawadi. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, he does great music for this, and, and it's innovating in a lot of different ways. But this is... It's a genre that people have talked about as puzzle television, which is they're constructing out of a script, not an arc that you really follow directly, yeah, it's but a bunch of question marks. And then you're supposed to kind of figure out how those question marks kind of connect with each other. And most of this last season was spent on them giving you lots of questions and you figure it out. And it was meant to try to, I think, obscure where the show was going. So no one really got it and it kept people around. But in my mind, that kind of, you know, the the ratings dipped a little bit this year. I think a lot of people caught on to that. Um, It redeemed itself a little bit with an episode they did late that was kind of a backstory on one of the hosts uh, in the park, um, and then the very last episode put things together again. So n- now I'm on the hook for season it three. Keeps, I'm going to have to keep it watching. Keeps it keeps a lot of discussion, which is probably why there's like 8,000 podcasts called Westworld. Yeah, there's quite a few podcasts um, that that try to you know figure that stuff out, and it's actually interesting. On there have been several conversations on Reddit news stories about this that uh, that people are figuring out a few of the things that the show is doing and they've actually rewritten parts of the show so people oh, don't wow. know it and I, I don't know if if that's maybe the best approach um but it's interesting people are tuned into it um so i'm on the hook i'm hanging in there for a season three um but really i want to see that show take off um what's interesting about season. when you hear the chatter that oh westworld isn't understandable or isn't everything i thought when you have so many choices Yep. What should I binge on? I mean, I was all focused on Westworld, and we're going to do it, and this is I can't wait till the second season. And somehow, right before I stepped in, somebody said, "Oh, you know what? You may want to wait a beat." Yeah. It's it's. Do you terrible. get affected by that? Uh, definitely. When you have so much to choose from, well, there are four others I, I'm really interested in, and well, one of those I know we've talked about. We're going to get to that yeah. one that you're you're into, and I am too. I'm actually going against my policy and listening to what you're saying on all this stuff because normally I just pull the the Frank Costanza from Seinfeld approach and go, I want to go in fresh. Leave me alone. <laughs> I don't want to hear any. Don't say anything. Yeah. Well, no, no spoilers here. I'm not going to spoil any of the fun, but um, but it, overall, Cobra Kai Westworld. I'm hanging in there. I'm okay. hanging in. We'll okay. see. We'll see where I they go. I might give it a shot after hearing that. Awesome. Now, two. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was almost exactly the same. Well, same it's me. Sonic property. It's there. me. But even the the intonation there. Okay, man, you're an expert at this stuff. Um, you're so an expert at being you. At being. <laughs> I'm the best. <laughs> the best Kenny we have is Kenny. Uh, so these are two now that I love. These are two that have really grown on me. One of these is a new series. Um, This is The Terror on AMC, which is a really interesting... This is a lot of the same people that are in The Crown on Netflix. Mm. Is this the one Um, you were tweeting about? Yeah. So I I tweeted about this uh, earlier, and the show is phenomenal. And this is such a bore... So I was so bored with the, the synopsis of this show, which it's... This is part of an expedition that was done in the 1850s by Britain to try to find a trade route through the Arctic. So Mm. they were just trying to find some channel in order to do that. The problem is these two ships, one of those is called the Terror, gets stuck in the ice. Oh, wow. So they're way up in the middle of nowhere, This you know, two ships full of people, and they're, they're stuck there for years. And 
it ends up, you know, a, a lot of people die in the process. They encounter these these what they think are are polar bears and some local tribes, Eskimo tribes. And Why don't they just make a phone call and I know you would think someone a. would have brought a cell phone or something with Text them, but. somebody. <laughs> But it's a really intense series, and there's some some kind. Of, it's one of those series that's doing something that's truly pretty fresh, and they're bringing in some almost supernatural elements that are still to this day mysteries about hmm. what happened. They only found this ship a few years ago. Mystery. <laughs> it was it was something that was uh, was. It, it's a really interesting show. All the performances are fantastic. It's it's I the, to check AMC it out. I spared no expense on this thing. It's a ten part series, and uh, and the whole thing is really really good. It's a little bit scary. Good. It's not a horror series. It's a drama, but it's intense. These are people that are fighting for they their live lives, in, and they, they live in tents or they live on the ship. They, they're living on the ship, and then oh, so you know the intense. ice starts to push no, the it's ship. In ships. <laughs> Right. <laughs> no, the ice starts to push Swing and into miss. the ship. So it starts to break the ship, and they have to figure out how to get out of it. Anyway, it's a really interesting series. That's probably uh, my favorite for the year. And then the last one, Robert, which I know is a big fan. You're a big fan of this one, is The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu. I am addicted to the show. I think it's unbelievably well written. What did you think of the series finale, Robert, that happened? That's, I haven't gotten there. Constanza, don't tell me. <laughs> Um, I have. I want to go in fresh. I haven't gotten there, and I can't wait. It's like saving, you know, the best piece of the dessert for the end. But um, I, I'm stunned by how good the show is. I'm, I cannot say enough good things about it, and I love yeah. the music too. The music's the great, music. and and the same way with the terror. It was a, a young composer that actually. Uh, I, I, had kind of a freak accident and the composer of the terror died uh, a couple years year and a half or so ago during wow. production of the show that's a very electronic kind of sound that's in there that's doing some really it's 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 a shame that uh that sometimes life happens that way but yeah. the handmaid's tale too is uh is something that really uses music to tell a story um and to emphasize things that are really good and frankly the story is great now i got a little th- it's trying to tie into pop culture quite a bit, maybe breaking a little bit of what is so good about The Handmaid's Tale. But really, I'm on the edge of my seat when I'm watching that. So that, those are two of my favorites. And uh, I think uh, Chris Beck has uh, an opinion on both of these shows. Sounds like five pounds of intense and amazing fun. Yes. <laughs> so that is uh, Matt's Summer TV nice Review. review. Summer, Summer TV Review. review. Very nice, Matt Schrader. Speaking of uh, great TV shows and and music, um, coming up next week, we have a new episode of The Inside Track with Dr. Sulan Tan, and it's a really cool one. It actually even mentions Seinfeld, Seinfeld. my favorite show. Um, But it talks about TV tunes and timbre uh, and how the different show themes, especially, um, take you into that world and really create the world you're going into uh, every time you start up the show. Yeah. I hadn't actually thought about this, but you know that theme from Who's the Boss? That is, I'd say the timbre. I think the, the timbre the really takes you into Tony Danza's house. Oh my goodness. It's just kind of amazing how it <laughs> transports me back. You know what, though? All, all, right, jokes, all, right, all right. jokes aside, <laughs> most of those shows, like once that tune hits, because, you know, throughout the shows, the music might be different, but... That starting theme song to play. Sometimes, you know, they have the option on Netflix to skip ahead, but I never do because I like to get in the zone. <laughs> you play the classic theme song each time? Well, not ne- <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about any show. Yeah. Some of these newer shows, uh, you know, Stranger Things, I always let Love the that. opening play because it gets you in the zone. It Big brings question. you into the world. Game of Thrones, do you let it, the whole oh, sequence you gotta go? Let that oh, play. of course. Good. Yeah. You gotta let it shows play. the map, you know where you're oh, going. The map is so great. Yeah. So that's a really cool episode. Stick around for our uh, new inside track that's coming next week. Next week. From Dr. Sulan Tan called TV Tunes and Timbre. What does a lumberjack say? Lamber. (laughs) I don't know, Robert. Timber. Oh, Timber. Oh, God. Okay, oh, we'll geez. be right All back right, after okay. this. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about our Emmy locks. The Emmy nominations came out during our summer break. So we want to get you all caught up and find out if we were right or wrong and uh, how we fared. Two words for you. Jordan Bieber. Right on. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Hey guys, Robert Kraft, and I'm inviting you to check us out on Twitter for the latest from the show, giveaways for Name That Score, videos, maybe even a new track from that pop superstar, Jordan Bieber. Check out our handle on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to this extended edition of Score the Podcast. We're going a little bit out of our normal run down here because of uh, we took our little summer break. Changing it up a little bit. Yeah, and when we were gone, the Emmy nominations came out. Just before we took the break, we gave you our Emmy locks, and now we're going to see how we fared. And uh, I think, Matt, are you going to run through some of these? And, yeah. And we'll, Why do we'll I get re- hungry when I hear you say Emmy locks? That just sounds so <laughs> like a delicious thing <laughs> that we should have served while we're well, running this down. Listen, we all made our, our, our locks, our sure thing. Maybe we should say that instead for uh, for shows and for score, the the original score um, for our our. Emmy nominations. I can't remember. Did we actually make any wagers around this? Because well, Matt Matt made a bold uh, <laughs> claim. Or well, looking at the results, we may have to. Uh, w- w- I don't know if this turned out quite as well as we thought. Uh, well, let's oh, give it a shot. We'll, How do we do? Uh, we'll review this stuff. Um, so here's we'll go through the dramas, the nominees for drama, then the mm. nominees for comedies. So first off, our locks for shows. Robert, you said Handmaid's Tale Definite. and Atlanta. Definitely. Kenny, you said Game of Thrones and Atlanta. Cheaters, you guys copying each other's answer. Duplicate answer. Sort of. I think that only counts as half. Uh, and I picked The Crown and Westworld for dramas. So the nominees that we had this year were The Americans. It was their final season. The ne- Crown. Neither of us. The Crown, which was uh, one of my picks, so I got one. Game of Thrones, of course, Kenny. Kenny's got a point. The Handmaid's Tale. Definitely. Robert got a point. Stranger Things, This Is Us. And Westworld. Oh, oh wow. So uh, the only person that got two picks out of that is uh, yours truly. Well, uh, you, what was my other drama pick? Atlanta. You didn't make another drama pick. You oh. made a comedy pick. You no did comedy. two drama picks. Yeah. So what's your com- so you don't have a comedy pick then. So that well, wasn't part of the uh, part of the rules there. <laughs> let's okay. uh let's dial it back Name up. Name <laughs> that rule book. Okay. Uh so nominees for comedies then mm. uh so that you guys can maybe maybe yeah. uh, earn your points back. Silicon Valley, Barry, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Glow, which I didn't think of as a comedy. Glow. I thought I didn't that was think sometimes of it as... that's what's weird about the whole comedy thing. It's like if there's a couple of punchlines in there, mm-hmm. they can sneak it in. It's, it's weird with the Golden Globes too. It they is. do that. Yeah, there's a lot of sometimes, kind of weird crossover. What was the, there was a movie a couple years ago that was I remember for the Golden Globes, and everyone was like, "What?" Yeah, I can't remember what it was. Saving well, Private no, Ryan as a comedy. Was, uh, yeah, right. No, it was The Martian. The Martian one yeah, that's for the uh, one. That's musical the one. or comedy, I think. And oh, yeah. Ridley Scott got up there and was like, uh, thanks for... This is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Glow, uh, Blackish, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon, and... Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's the winner. <laughs> you guys both get a point there. So, our score so far, Robert, one and a half points. One and a half. Kenny, one and a half points. One and a half. What, where is this, what is this half point? I don't understand. Uh, you both picked Atlanta. Like, oh, okay. we got to split the point. You're, you're docking us. And Matt, two points. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Pulling ahead. See how I did that? Yeah. Uh, all right. So now Those we are have... some tough categories. Tough. For the shows, and man. Great, some great shows. In Curb there. was so good this last season. And uh, there's a lot of good comedy. Glow. Yeah. I've I've watched a few episodes of Glow. At, that was for the first season, right? Which was really good. So. Yeah, I I checked it out. I liked Mark Marin. I liked both girls. It was good. It didn't it didn't like thrill me. But I I'm allergic to hype, as those of you who yeah. work with me. And I came into Glow thinking it's going to go Citizen Kane. Uh, to kill a mockingbird, <laughs> every episode of the Honeymooners and Glow. It's the best show on TV, and I watched it with such a high expectation. I yeah. thought it's okay. That is a hurdle. It, that, that's something that'll rebalance, I think, with a lot of the streaming services because yeah. they're outside of the regular system. I um, still think Atlanta is just a runaway, though. Yeah, Complete. so good. Atlanta is a great, great show. Okay, so that's our shows that we did so far. Then we have our locks for music in a dramatic series. Mm. This is where we fell off. Now, Robert picked The Handmaid's Tale and Homeland. Kenny picked The Crown and Westworld. And Matt picked Legion and Mr. Robot. 
So well, he, first of all, it's clear that I'm correct uh, <laughs> just because those shows are so great that uh, the music is an integral part, so I must be right. Was I? Well, uh, no. No. Uh, Emmy darn. nominees for music in a dramatic series, Game of Thrones, uh, which nobody nobody picked. I think maybe that was too obvious. Jessica Jones, Sean Callery. Once Upon a Time, Mark Isham. And nice. Cindy O'Connor and Michael Simon also. SEAL Team on CBS, W.G. Snuffy Walden and A. Patrick Rose. Amazing. I saw Snuffy, Snuffy the other night. I love that name. Shout out to Snuffy. I, I saw him Monday night. Did you really? Oh, Snuffy's the greatest. And then this was an interesting one, too. Star Wars Rebels on Disney XD. Yikes. Who scored it? Kevin Kiner. <laughs> so <laughs> Good job, Kevin. <laughs> we completely struck out. Uh, wait, 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 wait. And then Westworld. Yes. Ramin Javadi. So uh, Kenny got uh, that apparently, one. Apparently... Javity is two. So of the, all of our score picks, we only got one correct. And, and that, that was the was one Kenny. we were talking about whether it would qualify or not, and clearly it does. Yep. So, so Ramin means... has, has Game of Thrones and Westworld. He's competing against himself. I yeah. hope that doesn't split Dang. the vote. Two, two entries in, uh, in that category. And uh, I like those odds. Those are both shows <laughs> that could very well win. So, yeah. so our final score, Robert, last place. Zero. 1.5. Nobody's Matt, listening to me, clearly. Two. And Kenny pulls ahead 2.5 points. Yes. The, uh, the winner of our Emmy nomination. So we, we got to make our actual Emmy picks coming up. We'll do that in a future episode. But, but I crunched these two for Name That Score. Because mm. I thought it would be interesting. And I think we can blend Let's them in we're doing. to make my zero come up. A kind of a blended score. So to date, score. now before we, before we play this game with Junkie, through, through the 15 episodes that we've done, anyone want to take a guess at who's gotten the most correct answers? so far well i'm gonna go with uh robert because he just cheats all the time <laughs> and the guests the guests seem to win the most so that's my guess i am going to go with the guests the, guests. Are the winners guests have gotten 86 percent of questions right so far good second place robert 81 percent of questions right not too far behind and kenny 80 we'll percent. A, so we're all in the 80s pretty the good 80s. We're gonna have to make a change here today well, I just want to congratulate myself and thank the Academy and uh, for my picks. That's really lovely. <laughs> Can we bring out the trophy for Kenny? <laughs> well, we got to get Tom Holkenborg in here first. Yeah, we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, Tom's going to join us. We're going to dive right in, Junkie XL. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Hey, Match Raider here. Thanks to all of you who've supported Score the Podcast with a monthly donation. Thanks to the amazing Jim Lane and Helen Lento, as well as Adam, Patrick, Xavier, Gracie, Emily, and John. As little as three cents a day helps us pay the bills, and right now you also get a free gift. The Blu-rays and soundtracks we used for the movie Score, a film music documentary in the Score archives. To join the crew, click donate at score-movie.com slash podcast or at Score the Podcast on Twitter. Back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast. We're here inside my favorite studio name thus far, the Computer Hell Cabin. Yeah. And by the way, if this is what hell looks like, count me yeah. in, because it is one of the coolest rooms we've been in. It's been portrayed <laughs> as something so terrible for the longest time. If, if someone can tell me that I would end up in a studio like this, eternity wouldn't be long enough. <laughs> uh, we want to welcome in our guest this week. Tom Holkenborg, a.k.a. Junkie XL. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. Uh, so for, let, let's clear the air here, because is it, is it Tom? Do you go by Tom? Do you go by Junkie XL? What do you prefer out well, there? Well, you don't get born a junkie, do you? <laughs> so I, You know what? There is some <laughs> evidence that if your mother yeah, yeah, was yeah. addicted. So. Mine wasn't. Uh, <laughs> no, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's technically Tom, and then uh, Junkie XL became my uh, producer name in the 90s, uh, halfway 90s. And then when I was um, uh, putting out the Elvis remix, um, my agent had a, uh, a conversation with uh, the lawyer from the Elvis estate. And I said, well, you know, we just listened to the remix of Elvis. We really, really love it. So what's this guy's name again? <laughs> uh, so my agent uh, said, well, his name is Junkie XL. And it was like quiet on the other end of the phone saying, you've got to be freaking killing us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for that release, we changed it to JXL. <clears throat> ah. So that's been another name that we use if if junkie is like too sensitive. Yeah. But um, I still do um, movies under the name Junkie XL if the movie is strongly rooted in pop culture. Uh, but if it's more like a serious drama, it's just Tom Holkenborg, like Black Mass, for instance. 
Yeah, that's interesting that you make that distinction because, I mean, the music, first of all, I'm happy to, to share that the music we just heard that you're working on a new picture is as exciting as any music I've heard recently, not to mention of yours, but just in general. I really heard a new level of... Yeah, it was incredible. I wish we could talk about it, but we can't. Yeah, but it's just, I can tell you that... <laughs> it's, I think the best way to describe it is it's the combination of Junkie XL and Tom Hokenberg. I heard two things. I heard incredible synthetic sounds that were really inspiring, and then full orchestra on top of it. And I thought, this is... This is the new age of film music right here. Plus, compositionally, you is hitting it out of the park an analogy that we can use with composing? Because that was extraordinary what I heard, those well, themes. Thanks a lot. I mean, for me, it, it, like, without talking really about the movie, I mean, we can't say what we're talking about. It's, it's the Peter uh, Jackson movie production, uh, Mortal Engines. But uh, for and me... And it comes out, you said... At Christmas. Christmas. Uh, th- nice. th- in, this, in the same week as uh, Alida comes out, which is uh, Robert Rodriguez directing and uh, James Cameron producing movie. But what's interesting for me, working on these two movies, um, working with these directors and producers, um, um, I have the freedom to really... You know, explore all these all these new things, which is really really great, and it feels for me also like a new time period, like where you're growing into like a, a new level of what you're capable of, and uh, better combinations of styles and 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 elements, and that's always great to feel that you you know that you grow as a as a composer or as a musician in general. I think that you also are working with two filmmakers who actually exemplify the visual aspect of what we're describing. They use both computer generated imagery and actors kind of a parallel to yeah. synthesis and orchestra yeah. so so all of you are working towards a new way of making art the other thing that you said that's really interesting is you said they both allow you a certain amount of freedom isn't it amazing that the directors who are at the top of their game are the ones that allow you freedom where it's the young ones who are the most nervous i don't know if the composer should do this yeah. i don't like that is that right the guys that are they hire an artist i mean i'm sure you get notes and i'm sure there's conflicts on certain things but it was just wonderful to hear you say they give you freedom because you think wow a guy that's that big jim cameron or peter jackson they're gonna have specific you do this and don't vary from my idea it's wonderful to hear you say you have freedom well, I have been very blessed, actually, to be honest, because I always get a lot of uh, freedom. And then once... So what usually happens with me is that um, they let me develop the initial con- concept of what the score is, like whether the themes, the sound, and I make these really elaborate pieces uh, that I send to the directors. Um, and, you know, they give me uh, feedback. What I usually would ask is, like, do you recognize your movie in this? And with one or <laughs> two small, ex- a, a, a one or two uh, exceptions out of the twenty, um, they embrace immediately like the concept that I come up with, and and so that's what I mean, uh, creative freedom. Now, when it comes to actually scoring a cue to uh, to a scene, that's where the director becomes very important in guiding you what he likes to see and what is important for him, and what is not important for him, and. Um, like I said, I've been very lucky to be able to work with directors and studios who are very open-minded. And um, it, and even if they were not happy with stuff, they were always able to very clearly let me see what they would like to hear there and what was important in the in the storytelling. And hmm. um, because I, I really noticed that um, I liked film so much and that's why I, I tried to make that transition into film like from 2000 on or so but we can chat about that a little later. But (laughs) what I really understand from the beginning was that if you are going to do this and if you want to be good at this, you need to be a filmmaker. You can't just be the music guy. Because well, you, that, that, that that's communication not, that, that, is so important. It's very and important. You've actually just articulated what makes a, the greatest composers. And I learned this from somebody that I know you work with, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. But Hans was clearly enlisted by the great directors to be a filmmaker with them and mm-hmm. he has great stories i'm sure you've heard them about working with ridley on gladiator and having well and a lot ideas. of scenes are created based on what the music is sometimes mm-hmm. they may have a new idea based on what they heard so 
as much as you are writing music, you're also creating scenes often or helping them develop into something else. It's such a high level of collaboration to yeah. work that way. Yeah, in my case, that's because before sometimes they even start shooting or sometimes before they start editing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they have all these very elaborate suites that I made with all these themes and all these musical approaches. And based on that, the, the, the edit sometimes turns out different than what you have before. It's always different when you come in three to five weeks uh, before, the, before the deadline and you have to deliver a whole new score. Or, uh, and that's, that's challenging. And then you know, it's a completely different process. There's less experimentation uh, room. There's less of, um, oh, let's try this, let's try that. It's all about like, okay, every move you make needs to be on the, on the money because otherwise, you know, the project doesn't get done. It's so interesting. And so in a way it's recent, the idea of creating suites and not sort of queuing a movie after the final, you know, nobody locks an edit anymore. But I want to, I want to ask about, you said 2000, you might have answered a question. As we both remember, and me very vaguely, and maybe you have a better memory than this, you came to see me at Fox. I know. I thought it was about <laughs> two and a half centuries ago. It might have been in 2000. And with all due respect, you were that day one of a number of people that came in and oh, said geez, hello. Robert. And you were just what have you done? like, uh, you know, hey, this guy's a cool DJ from Holland, and somebody said you should meet him, and I listened to this stuff, and I thought, this is cool, but, you know, I get to see a lot of people who say, how do I get into film music? And frankly, I discount a lot of them, because that's the last time they ever talk about it. They talk yeah. about it, and it's then... It's a short you, idea, and they get out. And then they, when you say, well, first of all, you're not going to be making records. You're going to be listening to a director tell you what they like. You're not going on tour. Uh, you know, and I had done pictures with Tom Petty or Eric Clapton, and they kind of find out halfway through, wait a minute, the guy wants me to come back and redo a, a piece of music. So I remember our meeting and thought, cool guy, and dug the music, but, and then P.S., I think I was faked out because you were serious, and I didn't know in that meeting. Tell me what you remember of that meeting and what happened next, because you were clearly on a path. And, and you, please, tell us yeah, the truth. You can tell <laughs> us how much no, you hate I, I, think. Who is this jerk? <laughs> no, I remember this, uh, this meeting very well. And um, so first we had a talk, and then you uh, took me around a lot. And then uh, Powell, John Powell was scoring, I think, Ice Age. And, oh. and you, you brought us there and then to show that a little bit. So... Um, so, but what you said was re really realistic in the meeting. You know, you kind of touched on it, and and I read under the under the lines what you were saying uh, that you know this isn't easy. This probably needs like a whole different set of skills that you have right now, uh, and that's all going to change when you want to go into this if you even get a chance to get into it in the first place. And I totally understood that. The thing though is that I technically already switched careers twice. Uh, my first career was. Um, uh, engineer producing in the studio. I started as an assistant engineer when I was 14 um, and I became the main engineer like by the time I was 16 and by the time I was 18 I was producing uh, international acts uh, and I, there was a career happening there and then I said you know what I actually miss making music so I want to start making music again. So I decided to do that in the late 80s, early 90s, that's when Junkie XL got born. <laughs> um, I made a, a bunch of different records, got signed um, to different labels, did worldwide tours. So by that time, you know what is required to get somewhere. So if, you, if your eyes are eyeballing something, it's like, I really want that. It's like, boy, there's no sitting down in a couch and waiting for that thing to come to you. So that I knew. So... And then I started meeting composers in town besides meeting heads of studios like yourself. And it became very clear for me there's no room for me in the front of the bus, let alone driving the bus myself. The only way to make this happen is sit in the back of the bus and then time by time you're able to move over a couple of chairs. Hmm. I make this joke um, uh, constantly to emphasize what the situation was. In the same year, I had a number one hit in 32 countries. I was in the basement of Harry Gregson Williams chopping up audio samples wow. for free. So that was that, that was humbling experience. No, but that was what what was required. And the same was when 
I quit uh, producing and engineering records, then becoming, um, you know, an artist and then try to get signs. Well, labels are like, well, you know, we would hire you instantly to produce this band, but to sign you as, a, as an artist, you got to show us some stuff. So, and that was, I went through that for years and years and years. And in, um, in 2008, um, I got kind of depressed that it was not going anywhere, and I decided to go back to Holland for a, a couple of uh, months. At the same time, I bought a house, and escrow fell through, so I also didn't have a house at that point. So all my <laughs> stuff was in uh, all was in storage. Yeah. Everything was like coming apart, and I was just hanging out in Holland and think like, so what am I going to do? Is like I, I'm, I I don't feel like coming back. Uh, let's let's just pick up where we were here in Amsterdam and just start all over. And then it started itching after two months and three months. And I was like, damn. I don't think I, you know, give it my full. Hmm. So I decided to go back and see what, you know, what LA was at that point in time. And I eventually found a house in Topanga uh, overlooking uh, Venice and Santa Monica and, and Malibu. Great view. And um, something had changed in myself. Before that, I wanted film scoring so bad that, you know, I was like, you know, a, a guy walking into a bar that I need to find this girl here tonight that I'm going to marry <laughs> and is going to give me 10 children, you know, over mm -hmm. the next 15 years. Then you have it written on your forehead and the of last course. thing you will meet is the woman that you want to meet. Course, right. So I was analyzing like that and I was like, you know what, maybe I should just scale back. And in those four to six months, actually, truly, I felt at the end of it, you know what, if I do become a film composer, that would be great. But if it doesn't happen, that's fine too. I, I just have a great life. I, am, I work with all these different people. That's great. And from the moment I actually started feeling that, everything started rolling for me. Like everything. And Is it's it weird possible? how that happens. Yeah. Is it possible that's like athletic in a way that when you're too tense, you don't win the races and when you decide to just relax. Have fun and, with it. And enjoy it and run. Suddenly you're getting medals, and that's just perfect. Yeah, well, and that's, that's exactly what happened to me. So I started then doing uh, some alternative movies uh, from from Europe, and then mm -hmm. um, I always had contact with with Hans, like because we liked each other. He respected uh, the all the electronic records that I put out and um, what I've done in that in that industry, and so. We just met up again in, in 2010, again, just for having a coffee. And then he wanted me to work on something small, and then that went well. And then he wanted me to work on something bigger, and that went well. And then it just moved on and on. And then basically with Man of Steel, that's when I met uh, Zack Schneider and, uh, and Christopher Nolan, who was the producer on that. That's when I had a really significant role, and that's how I got recognized by the studios. I got recognized by uh, Zack Snyder, who then, after that, gave me 300 Rise of an Empire. Yeah. Was, there a, was there a moment that you encountered where that, whoa, that just happened, that, that this, is my, this is maybe my this big This got me break. over the hump. Yeah, I mean, like, I really felt with, with uh, working, you know, as a as an assistant to Hans for for Man of Steel, yeah. it's like that was the moment where I was able to really show to not only the studio but also to Zach and and to Hans, obviously. You know, this is what I'm made of, and this is what I'm capable to 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 do. And um, once I secured uh, 300 Rise of an Empire, then after that went really quick. Like then I got Divergent and. Uh, Mad Max and then Black Mass and then Deadpool and it just went really really quick I, after that we, I mean it's funny I see it I look at your credits and you can see that it just there's then one here then one here and then suddenly it's just how can you be writing that many where was um, Paranoia in that sequence because I think we have a cue from Paranoia here yeah that, P P Paranoia was uh, was a um, a movie that I actually chased myself because I, I read the script and the script was really good and then I heard who, about the cast and the cast was going to be really good um, and then eventually I, I saw the film and I did do the film but the, the movie just kind of uh, f fell apart in the process I, just, I remember hearing the score and I went and found some of the cues because I thought this is a new f approach to film music too I mean this is straight up Electronic, but yes. I thought, yeah, okay, this sounds coming into movies, and I have to be sensitive to it. And if Junkie XL is now scoring movies, which I remember thinking 
shoot, that guy, I wasn't he on like <laughs> sitting there? I like, blew it. I, I, that was my moment, and he was the of those ten meetings. He was the guy. Tom, something you said r- makes me wonder because we talk a lot. We've talked with a lot of composers about their path, and it's very interesting. You know, some composers have really kind of crazy paths to where they end up, um, but you're hitting on a certain desire that you identified early on to score film, to put your musical talents to work on a film. What was it that drove that kind of that passion that you identified that you realized this, that, not even this, that over there, that's what I want to do. I know I want to do it. What, what drove that passion? Um, a couple of things. For starters, um, I've always liked films and I always analyze films for many, many different reasons. And the films primarily that I liked were um, uh, provided with a really oddball mix of uh, of what music was. So I always felt if I'm in the right time at the right place, maybe there's room for me to do that too. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, Shaft with, with like uh, James Brown. We're talking about the first James Bond with, uh, with uh, the John Barry arrangement yeah. uh, score. Uh, we're talking about, funny enough, Saturday Night Fever with all these like yeah. now classic disco songs in it. We're talking about Blade Runner with, with Vangelis. I mean, those were the movies that were really special to me um, because of the use of music and how well it, it worked. So in my early days, I wasn't the one that would be all over Star Wars and things like that. That was just not really for me. Um, and... Um, then later in in the in the, the process, I also started admiring more uh, the different uh, disciplines that make up a film. Uh, whether it's directing, script writing, it's the the set design, it's the clothes design, it's um, the special effects. The last uh, twenty years that that get added, and then of, obviously uh, the mixing process. Um, like I said, I was an engineer producer, and and the mixing of the film, the final stage, and the dub is something that is so, you know, I'm so fascinated by it. And working with the with the dubbing engineers, how to how to make things better, how to make the experience better of the film, and. Um, so I, I thought there was hope for me uh, in particularly that world. And then something else happened at the same time, like in the, in the late 90s, um, when I was still having my Junk XL career, um, I felt like I was really hitting a harmonic ceiling and a melodic ceiling. Like I was able to do stuff, but that was it. And that's yeah. when I really started fanatically uh, studying music theory and music uh, philosophy uh, to really get really into what makes things good and um, good sounding and what makes things emotional. And what's really funny is that when you really dive into it, that emotion actually can be quantified, like what that Mm. is. And if you use that formula over and over again, every time people say, that sounds so emotional to me. And then if you divert that path and you do something that doesn't follow certain rules i'm not talking about rules like you should do this and this and this i'm talking about rules that have been defined by physics um then people don't necessarily know what to do with that piece of music and um bach has always been a master of that with uh, in in his uh time period and um so for me theory became very important as a tool Whereas when I was studying in my earlier years, I had theory too, and and I studied music university for a year until I got kicked out. (laughs) Um, And um, so what happens is with with kids that are so young and they get completely drilled and completely brainwashed with music theory and being very technical at a certain instrument is by the time they're 25, 30, they still haven't figured out what their own voice is, like what they really want to want to achieve. And I think that's one of the reasons why in film scoring, you see so many people come from a completely different background. I mean, let's start with, you know, the biggest one, um, John Williams, you know, just like he was the keyboard player and the arranger for Henry Mancini. Yeah. And, um, and I would just worked with Conrad Pope and he said, yeah, if you want to write like John Williams, just, take any song and just like rearrange it and revoice it that's 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 what he does that's where he's a master at so let me get this straight i could be if i just rearrange <laughs> moon river i'll be scoring just like switch Johnson. it around but Still you're hope. absolutely right no, you it's, know, it's, he was johnny williams playing sessions yeah. in, in in la i don't think anybody would say 
this is the future of you know the great film so, master. So, so, so there's so ma- there's so many com- uh, composers uh, working now uh, currently in LA that have such an incredible uh, colorful background, uh, yeah. and um, and they move their way into film and, and find like hey you know I have actually more creative freedom. Funny enough, even though you're working on a film and you're working with a director, like for me, um, when I was music making music on my own as Junkie XL, and I'm going to use another analogy here. You would basically send me into a room, a really big room that has all the different canvases in the world. It has all the uh, paint types in the world, watercolor, uh, uh, oil paint, all the different tools. And then you would close the door and say like, I want to make you a masterwork and I'll come back in a week. Those are the scenarios where I usually get lost. Now, in film scoring, I get, no sent, into, I, I get sent into a room. There's only one canvas. There's three colors and one pencil. And now go make your masterwork. I love work. that. And that's when my brain goes on fire. Because with the limitations that I have, you have rules, I, seem to be, I seem to be stronger in, in my creative output. Oh, I, I really understand that, that there's something about an assignment and a structure and a deadline mm-hmm. that I... Oh, I have to I, have a deadline. I don't know if it's age-related, because as a young musician, you kind of love the freedom of, I'm going to make stuff up. Whatever I can, I'll write a song. But certainly when you realize that inspiration is often hard to find and what are we going to write about today? Somebody says, can you, I need a piece of music for the girl to walk down the path and jump off the cliff. How's that? Um, in two and, hours. And then the- she gets caught by the hero just as she hits the girl. Well, I, I have a quick follow up, Tom. Did you really get kicked out of music school? Well, more or less. I mean, it's, it, it, so I, um, I studied, uh, 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 drums and and jazz guitar hmm. and uh, the it was a small school in the, in the north of Holland and there's a limited room there for students so I I did got admitted um, and he always wanted me to practice the scales and stuff like that and and I never really <laughs> did I did like a bunch of other stuff yeah um, so one day uh, I came in and I did promise him the week before I would do my scales but then I came in with a cassette. You know, all this cassette. So <laughs> right. basically, what I had done the two days before is I had written a composition for 100 notes. So uh-huh. I recorded 100 notes on the tape. Then I took the tape out, cut it in 100 pieces, and just shook it in a can oh. back out and just glue, glue it together like in, in a random order. So now we would play back the tape. Some of the notes would be uh, reversed, some of them would play back straight, Remix. and some of them would be uh, <laughs> cut up. And then bits of it you would hear later. Do you still have it? No. Because that's, ah. that's it was, it was Dada just a, or Surreal. No, I mean, it was just, just an interesting project. And, yeah. But yeah. something interesting came out of it um, because the, the, the tape cuts were all the same length. Yeah. So therefore, they worked in time. And then on top of the playback of the cassette, I had uh, a tape delay with a certain time. So certain things would then repeat like two notes after. On, and so you got this interesting Ooh, harmonies and stuff. That's cool. And he didn't uh, like it? Yeah, I take no, it No, I mean, he was, he was like, you know... Uh, where are your scales? And, uh, <laughs> and then so I got into a fight with him and then I, I, um, I left. And then basically he advised the board not to continue with me. So I could potentially have studied for another year, but, I made, it, but I, yeah, yeah. I made it very difficult for me. He is uh, <laughs> regretting it today. It's interesting, though, those, those challenges. Like there's so many people that have some kind of musical idea that isn't embraced right away. And, of course. and there's something to well, it. Well, yeah, you're, it's you're not, breaking it's the mold. You're others. doing something different. And if you're not following the path, sometimes the yeah the I mean, heads don't like it. But then I, you start something new. I think. No, but yeah. the thing with music, music education is, and I think it's it's a whole lot a whole lot better uh, at at this point. But the, the the problem with music education is is that music has always been very popular, but now it's on the brink of a whole new level of popularity because it's so easy to make music yourself. Uh, you know, any computer that you have basically comes with like music making yeah. software on uh, already on there. Right. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to to do that, and therefore the demand of proper music music education on a college level is also. Uh, on the rise and all these colleges try to um, feed that demand and so that was the same in Holland there was the 
the the the classic conservatorium what we what we call it is like if you wanted to be a violin player or uh, a piano player classic classical so they just two years before that started the school where you could now learn jazz and that was like woo that's like <laughs> that was like so sexy that we now had a and this is like way into the 80s you know just like no synthesizer stuff no jazz a music that had been around for a good 30 years 40 years already you know so they finally caught up to oh maybe we should start teaching jazz and now you see that same development happening on uh, electronic music yeah. so now you can go to you know a college and you can study but you know I'm not sure if if, if that's the way forward or not but um, it, stu students are really hungry and they want like more information for that so and that's exactly what happened to me and then after a year I was like you know what this is not for me I'll, f I'll figure this out myself I think the irony is that now they're giving assignments to current students to take a hundred little pieces of tape and cut them up <laughs> and put them back together yeah. to no, show. No. Things have because, changed a little bit. Uh, no, but I think that you, I mean, there's something really wonderful in that story because it, first of all, shows you creatively being very creative. Uh, forget the assignment. You did something very creative, tape yeah. delay and musically. And it's it, almost as much about that, that aspect of, of having to figure it out yourself versus even if there are class projects now that might might kind of stir a little creative energy among students that that thing that comes from an idea of like what if i did this well no there's some really interesting things that come well from when that. i was when i was uh, 13 14 uh i had different instruments at that point i had a guitar i had a um, i could borrow a bass guitar uh i was working together with um my best buddy uh who is a keyboard player and piano player we were able to uh, uh, rent or or borrow a synth, but what we were short of was multi track. Uh -huh. That that you couldn't borrow. You know, yeah. at that that's like before the four track cassette tapes came out and stuff like that. So I built a multi track myself, where mm. um, I was working also as a kid with um, a radio and TV shop where they sold cassette players, video players. Yeah. You know, just like super small countryside yeah. town. But then there were cassettes that were not properly working cassette players, the front, the front loaders, the, the yeah. ones, the hi-fi ones. And some of them were not working properly anymore. They would be traded in. And I would take them. And then with the engineer that worked them, we would fix them up. And at a certain point, I had four. And then I found out a way how to synchronize the, the, um, the engines oh. in the four cassette tapes. Wow. So now I could basically put like four... Uh, cassette players on record and they would more or less run in sync i mean yeah. enough for like two three minutes and that way i was able to record uh let's say drums on cassette one bass on cassette two multi-track one synthesizer on cassette three and then mix the three of them down to cassette four and then i had like three left you to are do it. Some george more. martin with the beatles no. making four tracks i'm, I, I'm I sure, sure you have, have you you have a assistance now, but do you still like to get your hands dirty? You have all this equipment in here. Are you still plugging, doing your yeah, own this, engineering? Yeah, this stuff is not really assistant ready. You know, they, they look at it with with admiration, but wouldn't know where Need to start. To. We'll, we'll put a couple pictures kind of showing everything that's in here. I don't know what most of this stuff is, but, it's but I see, and we'll talk a little about yeah, studio maybe. time, too, uh, which is something you put together that's really cool. Yeah, we're going to uh, take a quick break. Up. We'll talk Before about studio we time. Uh, no, I think we're going to go out to a quick break, as as Kenny said. But I just thought this was the first track of yours I ever heard. And I thought we'd go to our break listening to what might have been the evolution of cutting up 100 pieces of notes into a kind of new, vibey thing. This is Molly's E. And I think it's good to go go out on a junky XL track. This is the first track you heard, Robert? This was the first one I heard, and I thought it sounded like movie music. And it kind of does. We're going to come back in just a little bit. Yeah, we're going to talk Mad Max. We're going to talk about studio time. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey guys, Robert Kraft, and I'm inviting you to check us out on Twitter for the latest from the show. Giveaways for Name That Score, videos, maybe even a new track from that pop superstar, Jordan Bieber. Check out our handle on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. Now, back to the show.
Welcome back to the computer hell cabin, where it's quite cool. You would expect it to be hot based on the so name. This is kind of a perfect a cue. N- the air conditioning <laughs> zone. Yeah, for computer hell. Plus, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot of fire in this moment. Yes. In one of my favorite movies the last few years, needless to say, and also one of my favorite scores. Mad Max Fury Road, yeah. Uh, when we were doing Score, a film music documentary, you talked about the drums and how you recorded them ahead of time, a bunch of different drums to, to go into production. Um couple of questions on that can you talk about how that's important to you to have the actual musician played drums of you know the drums that you selected and then w- was this an idea from the start do you go back and re-record once you get the layout or does it stay that way like can you talk about that process because it seems a little different from writing something having an orchestra record it and put it to picture yeah that's never going to happen in a, in a movie score that i do so there, there's elements will be replaced but a lot of elements will uh, stay as they are, and uh, especially with uh, percussion. Also, because I'm a drummer, percussionist myself. So usually I take care of all that stuff myself. And um, yeah, you just you know you get the drum instruments that you need for a specific um, a movie. So sometimes it's it's more, sometimes it's less. Uh, for instance, with uh, Tomb Raider that came out this year, uh, took place on the Pacific Island, so I needed Pacific Island drums. No, mm-hmm. those were not easy to get. And, and eventually, I found a builder uh, who built unique instruments from, from, for me. From, in LA? From the, and actually, well, I was looking everywhere around over the world. And funny enough, I talked to a guy uh, in Indonesia at a certain point, and he reverted me back to the better instrument builder, and he's in San Diego. I wow. mean, like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a coincidence. But, uh, for instance, for 300 Rise of an Empire, I needed... Uh, a bunch of hand drums and um, an instrument that's called a duff, which is uh, a very thin hand drum with like rings on the inside, and it makes up very snappy sounds, and you move the thing around, and it also creates a rhythm within the rhythm. Now, those are very hard to find, um, but then at the time, <clears throat> I had a Persian uh, assistant, Ahmad, and he made some phone calls in Iran, but obviously we couldn't do any business with Iran because there was an embargo. But <laughs> so we bought a few uh, hand drums. They were smuggled into Turkey, and then we got a package from uh, from Turkey sent to oh, us. Oh wow! Yeah. So um, <laughs> so all these things are you know just very interesting for the CIA and, will be here shortly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, and so for for Matt Max, it was a lot of. Uh, two pans and and surdos and and um, so yeah I mean I went shopping you know in uh, Brazil Argentina uh, found a bunch in um, in Mexico also in in Europe wow that's so cool. I, have you ever just out of curiosity do you know the percussionist Mike Fisher name yeah he's one of the great studio players of L A and he is legendary for his truck full of instruments and he and <laughs> right. you know Emil, um, have always been the two killer uh, percussionists who, on every tour they ever took, they went. And when you mentioned those instruments, Mike would say, "I'm going to Thailand to play with you know Larry Carlton for, or Steely Dan or whatever it was," and he'd come back with stuff, stuff, <laughs> yeah. keep some stuff. So, next, um, next picture. So when when you're recording these drums, you go to a, a, a recording stage, I imagine, with with drummers, and do you just no, them. I do it myself. Oh, you do it yourself? Mm-hmm. Interesting. And was you just every, hit a, every drum on Mad Max, was that you? Mm-hmm. It was. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, okay. <laughs> I, I had this, this idea from the way that, that I, I think we first discussed this, maybe for the movie, that you brought in some players to do, you know, bang on different things and recorded each one of those. But that's all you. Yes. Wow. Now the only the only uh, percussion session that I did, uh, and that was for Hans at the time, Man of Steel. That's when we had actual uh, twelve amazing percussionist drummers. <laughs> yeah, like right. in in one room, just like in the square, and I was in the middle conducting the drummers. Why is it important to record yourself playing it rather than just use like a sample? And is there can you control the the feel of the way that you're hitting the drums, or can you talk a this little is, bit about this? This is interesting with uh, the the way that I work is that. The benefit of using samples is uh, gigantic on multiple different levels. Um, so I I'm, I'm, might get a little technical at this point, but a lot of people that aren't film composing will understand what I'm what yeah. I'm talking about. So, for instance, if you take like live strings versus uh, sampled strings, 
the um, the sample strings uh, are very detailed in uh, certain frequencies because they were you know recorded note by note and you and you program them note by note. When you have a section of sixty eight guys playing together, you have less control over that. You have less control over uh, how certain frequencies work, um, and that's the downside. The upside is that samples. It doesn't matter how good you program them they will never sound like 68 live players. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a enthusiasm, there's a, a certain messiness, there's emotion, there's uh, unexpected things that, that happen with a, a live orchestra. So, but how do you take benefit from both of them? So one of the tricks that I use is that I do use my samples um, in the final mix where also the live strings are playing. And then you start analyzing, but what frequencies do I really need from the samples? Well, primarily low end. So, you make sure that the low end is very well emphasized in your mix, but everything above uh, three to four thousand uh, uh, hertz, uh, three to four hundred hertz, you basically shelf out until you get to eight nine thousand hertz, uh, and then it comes. Which back is up. the low end, the eight to nine thousand. Low the, end the, and no, then no, the high the, end. The, yeah, the, so you use the low end and 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 the high end. So where is the the, the live strings really predominant? It's it, technically in the frequencies that we obviously hear uh, from four five hundred to like eight thousand or something. You really feel like the live playing, the intonation, the emotion that's in there, and then the combination of these two with level differences and different sets of reverbs, um, you create a sound that has the benefits of the samples, but is unmistakably live because the, the orchestra is... perfect t- marriage exactly. of, of synthetic That's super and orchestral. Interesting. So it, do you ever, when you complete something, you record these things, you, you lay it out on your, on your uh, program, and then do you go re-record the completed thing with uh, orchestra, or are there certain parts that you re-record if you write something with strings or... No, I mean, like, first I, I do all the writing with the, with the samples in the computer, and then you determine what you want to record with the, with the orchestra. You go in, you record the orchestra, and then you come back, and then you start uh, processing uh, the files, and then you start to find that really uh, peculiar mix between, like, what is samples and what is, uh, what is live. And that takes, you know, quite some time. I mean, usually on a movie, if I can, uh, I spend, you know, three to four weeks on that, just doing that. Just in p- the so post the di- editing? The directors here, the, your demos, if they're really demos, the suites are pretty much all synthetic mock-ups of where the cue would be. And yeah. then once they're approved and it's all shaped to film, yes. you then record. Yes. But, you know, there, there have been uh, uh, scenarios, not with the orchestra, well, actually, yes, with the orchestra, where... I would have, um, let's say, an orchestral uh, session before I even start writing the music because I need certain mm. tones that I just don't have. In uh, your library? Or- yeah, to create your own like uh, toolkit, yeah. if, if you will. Um, and uh, that's especially effective on um, uh, horror-type uh, movies where you need these really eerie uh, qualities of the orchestra. And... When you're working on a cue, it doesn't necessarily need to be written exactly like that. So that's where the where the toolkit stuff comes in really, really handy. And you can uh, you can way better than show the director what you're actually after instead of like programming it with samples because it's tougher to to do that. That's really interesting. Everyone has their own style, so it's always interesting to hear how you sit down with your paintbrush and if I'm using your canvas analogy i mean i would say like you know where we've uh landed now in in uh, 2018 maybe one or two composers out there are potentially exempted from from this but i think anybody else it doesn't matter whether you're paper pencil guy whether you write on a piano or whether you write on whatever instrument but in order to get your score approved by the director and the, and the studio you need to have some sort of mock-up what what they call well and they know the is, they know the be. technology that they can make changes exactly. so if you're not doing it that way <laughs> and they Stuff want changes it might make your life it's right, actually right. really important what you just said because so many young composers don't understand it it's the varsity level of getting this done they think if i hey i mean you must get this too i always get these these emails that say, I've written something that sounds like movie music. And I, say, I don't even know what that means anymore. <laughs> right. And that doesn't in any way translate to 
building a skyscraper for a major motion picture, which is what creating one of these scores really... Yeah, you can write a kind of cool thing on your brand new synth, okay, and or, you know, and Pro what? Tools. <laughs> and then what? Right, it's such a distance, and a lot of them don't understand it, but I think, I think you're leading the way also in a whole new level of an approach to this that's sonic as well as musical. I mean, that's so obvious, and... I don't know if that was ever as present. You dropped a microphone on a room full of players, you know, Alfred Newman on the Fox stage, and you recorded as robustly as you could, and that went into the movie. This is a whole new universe. Yeah, but that that is also um, a different craft and a, and a very old craft. And uh, a very and, old craft, too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I hope that that craft is not gonna gonna disappear because it, like with all professions it it's you know you see it for instance in holland with um completely different example bakeries you know every every town had like a bakery every morning you would get fresh bre- baked mm. bread and it was like amazing and so well done and good and you know and then the introduction of the big grocery stores came mm-hmm. um like the Ralphs, the Albertsons, the you know yeah. of of this world, and one by one they're gone, you know. And there's maybe a handful left in 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 Holland that still have that original craft and and put the love and and energy into it. That artisan kind of thing, exactly. So and that's what film composing in the old school way will become. You know, just potentially in twenty years. Uh, I would be highly surprised if you just run into somebody who's like, "Oh no, no, I'm I'm still a paper pencil guy." So, uh-huh. Well, good for you, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's gonna be um, something else, and that was a an, an an art. Like if you go back to the first like groundbreaking film score, Max Steiner for 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 King, King Kong, Kong, and all the way up to you know the first uh, Star Wars with uh, John Williams. You know, that's a time period where composers in that world really perfected. Um, you know how it how it can be done with with all the greatness with it and and you know John Williams is still carrying the you know the torch for that as being the most talented the king most, most, yeah exactly when, when we interviewed you for score another part of our interview um, this was what 2015 I think it was yeah 15 mm-hmm. um, is when you started studio time we noticed that a lot of the the around the world there were fans both composers aspiring composers and just fans that were desperate for content from composers like yourself um and for those who don't know studio time is the series that that tom does uh you've done two seasons so far that are real. it breaks down certain things that you've constructed on different films and different your approach to different things which is really a, a really useful tool and I it's would it's super interactive too because you you put out little challenges and people send stuff into you i mean you you obviously have a busy schedule what inspired this and and why do you continue to do it? What what does it what does it give you? Um, well, e- education is a really big thing for me, and um, comes from my family too. My mom was a, a, a violin teacher and also a teacher in in uh, general music uh, theory. And then at night she would teach extra classes for kids that you know came from less fortunate families, and she wouldn't charge mm. any money for that. And um, <clears throat> so that's how I grew up. So that was already like a thing. And then when I was um, uh, 29, 30, 31, something like that, um, one of the bigger music universities in Holland approached me to set up uh, a four-year program, more or less models on what Berkeley was in, mm. in, in Boston. There was no such a thing in, in Holland. So I helped them do that. And I was... Uh, um, attached to that university for almost like 10 years or so. Um, and so I quit in um, somewhere in 13, 14. And then I was thinking for a really long time, it's like, okay, I want to continue doing something like this. And yes, I would go to things like USC, you know, to give like a master class or, you know, help out here and there. And that's when the idea got born is like to do proper tutorials uh, online. Uh, so they not only uh, show the way that I work into absolutely into detail, uh, but also how you uh, build up your computer setup. How do you set up uh, your sessions in Cubase? How do you do this? How do you do that? It's really like um, um, I'm trying to make it like a manual for new, inspiring uh, composers to see what certain solutions are. Um, 
uh, what I say many times in the in in the series is like I'm not like some master film composer, or whatever. You know, that's John Williams or Hans Zimmer. For me, it's just I want to show what I do, and then when you show what I do, then you could say the guy is an idiot. You should do it like this, or you should do it like that. That's fine. And other people find it's like, wow, I never knew you could do it like that. Yeah, um, how to approach like right. certain things. So for me. It's really great. It's also super rewarding. Like the, uh, generally, the, the comments back are fantastic, and it's really picking up. St- yeah. I mean, some of these episodes have been watched like half a million times. Yeah, I was going to is- say, are you surprised by that? We were certainly surprised by the worldwide reaction of, of putting this movie together. But I'm, you, you're getting millions right. of it, hits. It's on part these. of that same thread, I think, of a lot of people that are, are tuning into some aspect of that. That you know, super creative film component. And now all these digital tools and analog tools, as we can see. Behind yeah. I mean, the, the, the subjects just vary com- completely from, okay, how do you write for strings? And just like, that's like a 50 minute episode. And mm. so it, it starts from scratch and then just build, you build a whole piece ar- around strings. Then the next episode, for instance, would be, let me take you uh, down uh, memory lane and, and show you all the classic samplers that have been released over the last uh, 40 years. And then I, have them all here so we switch them all on and we sample a sample and this is what it sounds in the mirage and this is what it sounds in the s50 and now we sample it in akai s thousands and now in the akai s3200 xl and people actually hear all the all the differences in uh, in 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 the sounds and then another episode i compare hardware samples with software samplers with with uh in 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 the in the computer and they can a b it most of them actually play it on good speaker systems or on good headsets and they can really and these you know, aren't these aren't low quality productions these look amazing they sound amazing uh you, you guys put a lot of time into it it's expensive to make um but it's a it's a labor of love and it's also i strongly believe uh giving stuff back to the community you know the same community that has given me so much you know uh I have a wonderful career. I have people that uh, buy my soundtrack CDs uh, that send me lovely emails or notes. And so I've, I, I'm from that um, uh, generation, I guess, that, that you know, I feel important to do something back for these people. And that's why these, these – and we do these Studio Time series without sponsors, without, uh, without um, commercials, without uh, anything. So it's, it's just uh, – it's really it's cool. Do you ever have a concern that you are educating your competition? <laughs> that, that, that someday, as it should, any of those people watching are going to come that, back yeah. and say, "I took this job away from the guy that taught me how to write for strings." <laughs> as it should. Oh, that's lovely. It's because, very generous. Because um, um, it, but it's the same. Compare it with uh, with uh, with signs and anything out there. You know, just like. Language is out there. Math is out there. Anybody can take those things and just build something amazing out of it that nobody knew ever existed. Um, so with music, especially on film composing, there's like little or nothing out there about that. And I remember, for instance, I was a massive fan of uh, Andy Summers, who was the, mm. the guitar player of The Police. Yeah. And I remember their first record came out, Outlanders del Moor, and then there was this little piece on the BBC where they would visit the the police in the studio, uh, just a, a one minute a little behind the scenes, a little behind the scenes, and then the the camera goes down and or the camera goes to Andy Summers and he's like playing guitar. He presses on a few pedals. The camera goes down. You see a little bit of the pedals. It goes back up and he plays some more stuff. That little clip I've replayed on a VCR. Like so many times to see what paddles there were it's and, all worn and out what now. the settings were. Yeah, I mean, Watching the I, sausage get made. People love it. Exactly. Well, so it it it's there were delay nice. pedals because I mean that was a big part of Andy's sound was kind of. Well, he had an ex, he had an exciter and then he had a yeah. chorus and then and a, and a delay. <clears throat> but um, the, 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 the back to studio time is like the the thing is like when it comes to education and when it comes to sharing uh, knowledge and even showing everything in detail how you did it it's like you can show whatever you did but whatever goes on in my head to come to that conclusion to do that um that is something you can't really educate and that's sure. what, what we can't really do so yes i show in detail how i did mad max and everybody can copy it i show it in detail how i did it but my brain is somewhere else 
um, doing sure. something else. He's not going to reveal that part of the secret. <laughs> you can't. That's the whole thing. Well, it's like, like you could study a Beethoven score, a manuscript. You, you can. It, it's not necessarily you can axiomatic. That Picasso. The, right. That the next thing you're going to do well, is um, compose make, like Go that. on uh, YouTube if you haven't watched Studio Time. Oh, it's uh, fantastic. Tom said they're working on season three and four now, but get caught up on one and two. It's really cool. And uh, yep. And I have a question, too, about uh, just approaching those things with fresh ears that I, I'll ask you in just a minute. Cool. So, yeah, we'll get to that in, in a second. But first, it's time to play the game that's sweeping social media. I think we have to say it. Ready? I'll let you go solo this time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to play <laughs> Name That Score? Get ready to play Name That Score! The film music game where a perfect score means you, yes you, could be a winner. Now let's play Name That Score. That All song, right. it always reminds me of Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, that, it is very tuned. Seth it's very family guy. So, Tom, you've done a couple of these uh, these huge blockbuster movies in your your uh, your career so far as a film composer. That's our theme today. It's blockbuster films of uh, of the the two thousands from two thousand to twenty eighteen. I think is eighteen on here. It's the number one film at the box office. So we have one For film year. from every year. We'll play a uh, a score. Uh, five famous film scores in reverse. Um, you, Kenny, and Robert will all pick from three multiple choice answers. The last question is worth double. And if anyone gets all five right, we give away a prize on our Twitter account at score the podcast. Just mention hashtag name that score to enter. And I will say on the way over here, Matt didn't tell me what the topic was, but he guaranteed. <laughs> that we are not giving away a prize this week, so it might Ooh, be a hard tough. week. Well, well this, I, didn't, I didn't guarantee, but I said I don't know. You're, you're that's a little thing, fast there, Kenny. I'm I'm definitely glad. makes me very certain about my strategy <laughs> well, once again, which is you guys go first, and then I'll have my answer after I hear <laughs> what you if guys you, guess. If you would have given us the topic ahead of time, we could have cheated because there's only 18 possibilities. I know, I know. You could, and you've look. You've probably seen most of these, so uh, some of the clips may be a little. Certainly tricky. hope so. All right, so question one, we'll give you the options first. Uh, um, is this from the clip we're about to play? And remember, these are in reverse. Is this from How the Grinch Stole Christmas, number one movie of 2000, James Horner, Harry Potter, the first one by John Williams, uh, 2001, or The Hunger Games, Catching Fire? That's the sequel from 2013. All right, Tom. I we think need, Tom we, might have we this, need you but to hold, identify, hold your answer for a second, Tom. What instrument was that, Tom? Can you identify <laughs> Kenny, Robert. It's not. It sounds uh, like a reverse celeste. I'm going to go with. <laughs> Robert points at Tom. I, I'm going to go with whatever Tom says. I'm, it's the reverse celeste movie. What, wait, Robert, what do you think? How I'm the Grinch Stole Christmas, Harry Potter, or I'm, The Hunger Games? I'm going to say it's a Harry Potter cube. I'm Robert's going Harry Potter also. That's what I was going to say. Tom? Yeah. Harry Potter? There it oh, is. Oh, man. It's really hard to identify the notes backwards. That's interesting, right? The texture of that completely flips. It's hard. It hard just to... sounded like one solid noise kind of. Yeah. Super. All Beautiful. right. So points for everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Everybody's Tom. one for one. We're moving on to uh, question number two. Animated movies. Uh, there's only three animated movies in the last uh, 18 years that have been number one at the box office. Those are Finding Nemo, Shrek 2. And Toy Story 3. And Let me can you give it one more time with the composers. Composers are going to be... Finding Nemo's Thomas, Thomas Newman, Newman. Shrek 2, Harry Gregson Williams. And Randy. And Toy Story 3, Randy Newman. Shrek 2. No one's reacting to that. Tom might... T I see no. a little smirk, so Tom might... Uh, I'm out. I'm out. I'm going... <laughs> Well, did you did you hear any of this when you were working with Harry? Oh, or? geez, look at this. <laughs> In reverse, no. <laughs> we always bring up John Powell because John Powell f it totally turned the tables on Kenny and Robert on this. And he gave a wrong answer first. I think they I both have to bit, go, and then he changed it. I think I have to go with Kenny as well, Shrek too, because on either side of it, both Newmans, first cousins, um, have <laughs> something that in reverse and forward, I always right. In, mm, and Harry, as brilliant <laughs> as he is, that is Shrek too. 
what what an explanation. All right, Robert saying Shrek two. <laughs> Kenny, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Too? Tom, no clue. Give you got a one in three chance. Finding Nemo, Shrek two, Toy Story three. I'm just going to say something. <laughs> Finding Nemo. <laughs> Finding Nemo. We have a winner and a loser. Our two hosts got oh. it right. It's, it's, from, uh, it's from Shrek 2. Which I think the first one was Harry Gregson Williams and John Powell. And then the yeah. second one was just Harry Gregson Williams. So this is actually kind of a John Powell theme, too. What year was that? Uh, this is 2004. Were you were you with Harry during the Shreks? Yeah, yeah but I'm, um, I was not working on it, but working with some, him. Yeah, I was doing some. I was doing some stuff for him, like um, some reactor instruments in the basement, and yeah, well, yeah, prepping some stuff uh, for him. on Windward Circle. Yep, I knew it well. There was a sushi bar nearby. That's very good. <laughs> that was very good. I was very, it wasn't Finding Nemo. It, it was. It was Finding <laughs> yeah. Eel. <laughs> And Yellowtail. <laughs> well, Actually, I, I Nemo. Got a, I got to back a, out to get to my... I think Finding Nemo is a good name for a sushi bar. Uh-oh. Let's go. The kids would hate it. <laughs> Quite, yeah, I, I don't know if the kids would go for that. Uh, all the millennials would skip that sushi. Uh, all right, question three is superheroes. This has kind of been the age of the superheroes in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Um, the first one is actually from 2002, Spider-Man uh, by Danny Elfman. The Dark Knight, 2008, Hans Zimmer, a little bit of Junkie XL maybe in there too. And uh, The Avengers, 2012, uh, Alan Silvestri. Play that again. Kenny oh, thinks he knows Go this. ahead, Robert. <laughs> I, I actually was so thinking that you, look, who looks so confused about what this is, would, would This is competitive because you guys are perfect so far. So uh, Even in reverse, that sounds like a Hans Zimmer co-progression. And Kenny feels the same. I'm going to let you go ahead, Robert, because <laughs> we're tied. <laughs> I'm going to go with Tom because he... Uh, I like Tom's. You're going. Point wait, of view. wait. You're going with Tom's answer. With Tom's That's answer. not like you. Hans Zimmer chord <laughs> progression. So I'm going to follow Tom. Kenny, I'm, I'm going to take Alan Silvestri. Kenny, we live and die together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it, you know it what? Still sounds like a Hans Zimmer chord progression. Yes. <laughs> it does. It's very yeah. Well. So uh, Kenny's perfect so far, which means he goes first from now on. Definitely. Now he's the front runner. So uh, we're go- moving on to question four. A couple of these are, are, are they're getting tougher. So uh, question four is sequels. Pirates 2, Dead Man's Chest, 2006, Hans Zimmer, Spider-Man 3, 2007, Christopher Young, or Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, Alexander Desplat. Oh, man. Yeah, and I have to go first? Mm-hmm. You want to hear it again? Yeah. Sounds very Spider-Man to me. I'm going to go Spider-Man. Kenny's going Spider-Man. Robert? Dead Man's Chest. <laughs> okay. You didn't even want to try to gauge He, he just gauge sat Tom's back with reaction, a huge huh? grin after saying I think, that. I think Robert feels he's on to something. Tom? I have a dead man's chest. Two oh, winners. Oh, man. Sorry. Tom and audience. Robert. I don't even know why. It just, yeah, I heard that. Oh, my God. It sounds so much different. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. This is one of my favorite Hans cues, too. Uh, Unrecognizable backwards. There was to, something in me. the kind of chromatic. Do, 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 do. I thought. I, I, yeah, there I was a rhythmic Hans. thing in there that was really, it made it stand out to me. Yeah. Uh, so. It's like Led Zeppelin with an orchestra. <laughs> uh, question, uh, our, or one of our famous lines from, from the movie that Kenny and I saw a thousand times editing the movie. Yeah. Uh, question five, 
So let's see. Let's let's get our our scores first. We have uh, Robert and Kenny that are now tied. Tom is one behind. So, uh, but this one's worth two. This Story one's worth of my double. Life. <laughs> so it's anybody's game. Yeah, but he has on a this. nasty habit of catching up in the final. <laughs> so, catching up and winning. Uh, so uh, here we go. Question five: Is this? Uh, these are the top three movies of all time, box office, not adjusted for inflation. It's overall. So it's Avatar, two thousand nine, James Horner, Star Wars: The Force Awakens, twenty fifteen, John Williams, or. Black Panther, 2018, Ludwig Göransson. Not I'm no there, longer huh? in first, so what happens now? <laughs> well, I guess, Robert, if we go by golf rules, Robert has to go first. He I'm won the go, last hole. I'm going to go way out on a limb because it makes no sense but say Black Panther because... I worked on Avatar, and I'd be slightly embarrassed if because I didn't hear anything there that made sense, and I didn't yeah. hear John Williams roaring yeah. through that. So by default, I'm going with Ludwig. I think I recognize the uh, maybe even the cue if it is Black Panther. It sounds like um, Killmonger's theme, if I'm not oh. mistaken. The, well, the beginning part. I hope you're right for I the sake too. of... Uh, it's pretty deep. <laughs> All right, Tom? Tom, here's your chance. If you go away from us, you could get a two-pointer Our options, here. again, Avatar, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, or Black Panther. For a fact, it's Avatar. Whoa. Oh, no. We have a winner. Does anyone want to change their answer? I don't, no, but I don't. we do have a winner, so who is it? Two winners. Uh, it's these two. <laughs> I was going to change my answer to Avatar. You'll recognize it's a little bit longer clip forward. And I think the 808s kick in in just a second. Yeah. Yeah, that was too recognizable, so we had to we had to trim that out of the reversed version. All right, so that now look, we got a tie. It's Kenny and Robert here, and uh, tiebreaker is worth two points too. I just made up that rule. I thought it was so, three when I was losing. So okay, it's three points. Actually, yeah, well, it's anybody's game. We got a tiebreaker here. Okay. Uh, okay. Question six. Now this this is where it gets this is where it gets really tough. Can I enlist Tom's ears for this one? Uh, no. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, good to know. Tom can still steal the game here. So uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, so question six. These are all Star Wars movies from the last oh, 15 brutal. years. Oh, <laughs> brutal. So uh, this might just be pick an answer. Um, but uh, the three options are Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, 2005, John Williams, Rogue One, 2016, Michael Giacchino, or last year's Star Wars The Last Jedi, also John Williams. <laughs> Nobody has an answer. <laughs> Why don't you just assign us all one, <laughs> and someone will win? Well, I want to, you, you guys can pick: Star Wars Episode Three, Tom, Rogue One, first. or Star Wars: The Last Jedi. Wait, why is Tom going first? You guys go first. Does it I, matter? I have, I have, no, I have no answer. <laughs> I'm you, gonna, can, you, you guys can pick one. I'll for take me. Michael Giacchino. Kenny's going to take leave Michael you guys Giacchino. The John Williams pool. John Williams, the last one. Okay. So, Tom, I guess you're going with 2005? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you just find it perfect. Can anyone recognize this forwards? No. Oh, we're going to get ripped by the listeners. <laughs> Robert's nodding his head. And pointing at me. And pointing at Kenny. Robert, what do you think that is? Kenny won it. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny won it. Kenny did win it. That is Michael Giacchino uh, from uh, Rogue One, uh, who wins completely by chance. So our big winner is... What Ken a big, big reveal. I know. Big reveal here. <laughs> Kenny Holmes. Thank you. Basically, we saw... <laughs> <laughs> but someday, I want to win... 
like you do. <laughs> <laughs> that was creepy. Uh, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, like one of one of my assistants is a uh, is a. Uh, John Williams connoisseur. Yeah. And I worked with the director who was also a John Williams connoisseur. Uh -huh. And so I was randomly to play three seconds of any cue ever written by John Williams. And it took 75 questions until the one had it wrong. Oh. <laughs> wow. Like just like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh, yeah, that's the, that and that movie, that and that scene, the battle scene. Like, really? And, and Identifying then, the incredible. scenes and everything? Everything. That's more than a John Williams fan, then. That's like a John Williams movie. <laughs> OCD <Yeah>. fan. <laughs> yeah. Steven um, Spielberg. What did you win, Kenny? Not that I'm envious. Well, no one ran the table, but as a measure of goodwill, maybe we'll give something away. You'll have to tune into our Twitter page to find out for sure. Nice. At Score the Podcast. Um, Tom, I have one last question I wanted to ask you. We threw around this a couple times, but um, in, in Score Film Music Documentary, you mentioned the idea of goosebumps. And when you're making a score, you, you want your music to be able to kind of give you that feeling. One of the, the, the big kind of challenges with that is you're watching a scene over and over and over and over and over. So there's a certain amount of, are you going to lose that, that kind of, that feeling of knowing if something does give you goosebumps or not? How do you try to keep fresh ears and eyes even in, in trying to capture that special kind of thing? I usually go by um, <clears throat> first instinct. And usually first instinct is what, what is right. And then after that, uh, you switch that part of your brain off and then it becomes just pulling man hours just to finish it, like yeah. almost like clinically, you know. So is there you, any amount of time that can pass <clears throat> that you can come back and kind of and hear that? Yeah. So thing the, again, if if um, there, there are like certain scenes I worked on an alternative movie um, uh, two years ago, um, and um, it was called Brimstone, and it's extremely emotional music, and and what we see on screen is is horrifying and and you know heart wrenching and you can't take that in every time you play the scene on that same emotional level you just can't you you watch it for the first time and then it's like oh i think i need to do this or i need to do that and then you start writing and then the whole uh dynamic between you and the film becomes extremely clinical and mm -hmm. then when you feel you're done you walk away from it for like half an hour hour and then you watch it again with that open mind mm. and just taking the emotion in. Do you feel that the, again? Yes. If, if you, if, well, the music hadn't been written yet, so that's the first time I hear it. And then I'll just make notes to myself and then I'll work on it another time and then I'll just fix it like really quick again, like in a clinical way. And then stepping back and then watching it with somebody else with you know a few of my assistants, what you feel. And then you kind of hear through the ears of them and then it makes... Do you have any sense of how often you can trust that that instinct? I'm sure sometimes you probably come back and say, "Oh, that's not that's not what I thought it was going to be." I, but that's, I but that's why film scoring is teamwork. You know, if if uh, if you don't hear it, the music editors that work with you might have a suggestion. The director might have a suggestion. Sometimes mm -hmm. the picture editor might have a suggestion. What's better? Like, not everybody is at war power for the full hundred percent, and you're not always delivering your best possible work so sure. by working in a team you expect your team to point out it's like that cue you can do way better on that just have a look at that yeah and well, then and, and then that that's how it works everyone's different too so maybe you want maybe you're doing something amazing that you you aren't feeling but then five people listen to it and go that's the that's the one you got to keep that so every everyone actually one of my something. favorite parts of working with composers is often more often than anyone would imagine a composer will play all these cues for the room the director mm -hmm. producer studio executives everybody leaves and i would be the last one remaining with the composer and often the composer would say i have one other idea which i didn't want to play in the room and it's really not together and it's kind of unmixed and you know four excuses and they play almost always the one that i'd say that's the theme that's the best, you know, because it was different enough or they weren't certain or they liked it. But it's curious how many times that would happen. And I always, almost now, when I work with an artist or a composer, after you've kind of done the main show, I often say, is there anything else? And they say, well, I have half of a thing. But sometimes you feel that you've written it 
but you're you're it's new enough or different enough. I don't know why yeah. that just was has been my experience often. It makes sense. Kind of a, a, a half an idea that's halfway there and you can tell if it's not there and you can tell if maybe there's something there. Yeah. I had one other question for you. Um the world of T V has become this big cinematic sound for scoring and you've done a lot of big films have you been approached to do any big series um does that interest you at all to do television yeah i do because i mean i primarily consume um uh, you know netflix or you know things on uh, on my on my laptop the various just services like, yeah this just you know um in bulk because i'm an insomniac so if i don't need to work hmm. i just basically ram through four five six tv shows seasons a week what are you watching what do you watch i'm now in the middle of uh, versailles which mm. is um a drama around uh, louis the 14th mm-hmm. but uh, but i watch so many i mean i literally watch three four shows a week mm. complete seasons oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so uh i completely forget so if people bring up it's like oh i'm watching the show oh i don't know it oh it's about this and oh wait I saw that, you know, <laughs> like it, it's too much. I, I just you could be a it. TV critic on the side. No, <laughs> <laughs> not my job. All right. Well, Tom, we want to thank you for joining us. We've been trying to make this work for a while now, and we know you've been super busy. So letting us come here to the computer hell cabin. We really appreciate Fantastic. you joining us. So interesting. No problem. Great to have you guys. Here. I thought so, it was inspiring, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the movie that you played us. Some top secret top secret music <laughs> at the beginning that's going to be magnificent some of yeah. your best work christmas ahead. yep be sure to check us out on our social media page at score the podcast on twitter and also go on to your favorite podcast app rate and review if you like what you're hearing and if not just move on <laughs> <laughs> or give us some stars just out of the just cause. kindness yeah, of your heart a couple stars maybe five this is robert Kraft. thanks kenny Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tom. No problem. I'll see you next time.